Um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, today is our uh, Black Homesteaders of the South and Louisiana Descendant Panel. Um, I'm excited to uh, present this. I'm Amanda Fallis from the City Archives. I'm an archivist there and I've been working there for several years. And then I've been working with Bernice Alexander Bennett, the author of Black Homesteaders of the South, for her presentation last weekend and then this uh, panelist discussion this weekend. Um, I want to introduce everybody. So, of course, we have Bernice Alexander Bennett. We have Dr. Rex Holliday. We have Dr. Dolores Mercedes Franklin, Dr. Antoinette Harrell, and Crystal Williams Jackson. And they'll all be presenting a short um, discussion of their experience, uh, finding their ancestors, and then what we want everybody to be able to do after um, our panelists have finished, um, you know, talking about their experience is all open up the chat and everything for participants to ask questions or have discussion. I'll explain more about how to do that once everybody has spoken. But with that said, I would like to turn it over to Bernice to begin. So last week, I spoke of the Homestead Act of 1862. And uh, just to say that the Black Homesteaders of the South book consists of 48 stories from Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, and Arkansas. And we're going to share the untold stories of Black homesteaders. You know, sometimes when you talk about land and who owned land and how did they own land, we're looking at land that was acquired under the Homestead Act of 1862 where individuals could get up to 160 acres of land. Now, can you imagine even finding an ancestor that acquired that much land? Well, we're going to talk about that today. So you will have an opportunity to meet the descendants of Louisiana homesteaders, Crystal Williams Jackson, Dr. Rex Holliday, Dr. Dolores Mercedes Franklin, and Dr. Antoinette Harrell. And I'm just so proud just to be in the presence of these descendants because they have just done their research and they can tell you about their ancestors. We have 18 land owning stories in this book, as far north as Claiborne Parish and Bossier, and also several in the Florida parishes. So you will have an opportunity to just read about all of these descendant stories. The stories that will be shared with you today include Frank Thompson, Andrew Richard and Sarah Jane Richardson, George Williams and Chester Williams and Henry and Julia Gordon. And you see the names of the other homesteaders that are in this book. And these are all of the descendants that contributed to the homestead book. So I'm going to just tell you all this project grew out of the Black Homesteader Project of the National Park Service, where we were basically looking for descendants to share their stories. And these individuals stepped up and said, I will write my story and share my story. So who are these homesteaders? Well, first of all, all were head of households and over the age of 21. We had men, single women, even widows that applied. Some were free people of color. Some were formerly enslaved. Some were former members of the United States Colored Troops and some waited as long as 15 years to obtain their land patent. So what did it take? Well, I'm, I want you all to understand, they had to pay a small filing fee, small for some, but really $14, that's a lot of money. And some even paid that much. They had to have money for farm tools and seeds and livestock. They needed transportation money because they may have traveled from the, their rural area 
to an urban area to file. For example, many filed in New Orleans, others East Baton Rouge, others in Natchitoches. So the travel was a requirement because they had to go there to file in the land office. They also needed other resources of which I've listed on this slide. So let me just stop talking and turn it over to our first descendant, Crystal Williams Jackson. Thank you, Bernice. And thank you for Amanda for having me. Um, my name again is Crystal Williams Jackson and my homesteaders were or are my great grandfather, George Williams and his son, my great uncle, Chester Williams. And here, thank you, Amanda, for showing the picture. Um, the journey to knowing that I had homesteaders in my family really began with my father in 1987 while I was away in college. Uh, my parents and my younger siblings traveled to my grandfather's birthplace in the Homer Haynesville uh, area of Northern Louisiana. And he, he had gone because he wanted to meet these cousins that he had never met before because he and his siblings had grown up in Arkansas, closer to the Tennessee border. So he didn't really know them. Well, when I came home from winter break, he said, he was so excited. He said, I have something to show you. you this is really exciting. You, you're not gonna believe this. So he brought out these pictures and he took these pictures with his camera. They were portraits that were in one of the cousins home. And when I looked at these pictures, I was really you know, taken away because these faces are the faces I had seen all my life. My cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my siblings, their children, my children, these were the same faces. From that point forward, Amanda, you can um, put the picture down whenever you like. Um, from that point forward, over the years, my parents traveled with and without us, and they uh, started collecting documents and stories and interviewing cousins, um, meeting new cousins. But when my dad died in 2008, all these things were just sitting in a box. And I said, okay, I'm happy to continue this. And so I did. Um, during the pandemic, I attended one of Bernice's virtual presentations and it prompted me to use the steps she had outlined we should do. And I looked back at the 1900 census and I said, George owned land. So I contacted Bernice and she was instrumental and helping me get a copy of the land entry papers. Some time went on and I'm working and I get this email and it says, Crystal, let me know if you can open this file because this contains 42 images. This is the largest land entry papers, you know, I have ever seen. And that day we were on the phone and we were talking and I really was blown away. Not only did this show that we once had land in our family, it also uh, helped break down or knock down some brick walls that we had on the tree because this was information that we had seen nowhere else in the testimony, you know, in acquiring this land. So my great grandfather, George, who had been formerly enslaved, Oral history tells us that he was used as um, he was used as a stud. He was to to breed, um, and he applied for the adjoining farm, the adjoining farm homestead in 1907. But mind you, in 1900, he already owned land. Well, this told us how much land: 55 acres of land. It gave the approximate date of my great grandmother's death. Um, it told us what year George died. It confirmed that George's third wife, Lucy, had died prior to 1913. And it told the story of how my great uncle ended up uh, staying, the only child that stayed with my, grand, my great grandfather. And he fulfilled those obligations and the requirements. And he, at the age of 24, received the land patent. That 
was information that I that just I was too excited. I called up Chester's grandson, I was named after him, and my 88-year-old cousin, who is only one of two remaining grandchildren of my great-grandfather. They had been, uh, they had grown up in that area. They had never, ever heard or knew that there was land in the family. So this was exciting for us. Um, since then, we've done more research. They're now talking to some of their cousins and people that they grew up with there in the area. And some of those people we're now learning, we're related to. Um, and so at this point, we are still researching. We're researching the witnesses that helped to give the testimony. We're doing some on-site research later this year. And we hope to write more homestead stories because a lot of these families we found out now, a lot of them had homestead properties. So we'll be writing the stories for those too. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Crystal. Okay, we are ready for our next presenter. Hello, I'm Rex Holiday or Dr. Holiday. And um, I wanted to share my story. My story is about my great, great, great grandparents. Henry and Julia Gordon. So um, first I wanna give credit where credit is due. My wife is the, uh, the family history researcher in our family, and she absolutely loves to do this. And one of the things that we were doing, uh, we used to take our kids with us is to transcribe cemeteries. And we did quite a few in uh, Stockton, California, Stockton uh, Rural. And we wanted to plan a trip to do some family history in Louisiana because that is where my mom and dad were born and raised. So we planned a trip in 2007 and we visited um, several different uh, grave sites. And one of the things that um, we did was to go down to the um, Greensburg, um, Greensburg office in uh, Greensburg, Louisiana courthouse. And that was where um, Jane had us look through some conveyance records. And we found Dempsey Kemp Gorman and Henry and Julia were listed as slaves to uh, Henry uh, Kemp Gorman. That led Jane to um, do some further research. And she found Henry and Julia listed on the Bureau of Land Management. So in 1870, Henry applied for 35.92 acres of land under the um, 1862 land, uh, land Act, Homestead Act. And let's see, I forgot, let's see how much he paid for that. It was, wasn't very much money in today's terms, but uh, probably represented maybe a month's worth of pay for him at the time. And then Henry unfortunately passed away in 1874. So here was Julia Widow with um, several children, young children, and she was uh, left with the, um, the agreement to, to um, develop this land. She had to develop, I think, with uh, 25 acres of that land. And so they did. Um, her children, I think her oldest was married, and so he had um, a son-in-law also helping with that. And in 1875, she was able to complete the agreement and pay for that um, that land. And I, I thought it was interesting because her former slave master, um, Gorman, uh, was uh, one of the witnesses on the application. So I thought that was uh, kind of a, an interesting um, irony, maybe, if, uh, if you will. But she went on to um, develop other uh, property later on. As she and her uh, son-in-law um, developed more property, and they sold that property um, later on to um, Gorman, which I thought, I wasn't sure why. But we still have property in the family today, and uh, Close to this area. I'm not really sure how they acquired the current property, but I just thought I love the story 
of um, Julia being this widow, you know, faced with this, um, you know, terrible situation where she and her husband has started this homestead uh, venture, and then uh, tragically he he passed away before it was done. But she was able to conclude that uh, that agreement and um, acquire that land. So that's that's the story of my my great 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 grandparents, Henry and Julia. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I will make sure that um, if you send me that picture, I will be I'll, I'll make a little page for these and I'll make sure that every attendee is emailed later this month with a link to that. Sorry about that. Okay, and our next presenter, which I believe was it Dr. Franklin or Dr. Harrell? It's Dr. Franklin. Great. Let me get your I'm going to get Dr. Franklin's first picture up as well. Okay, I am uh, Dr. Dolores Cecilia Franklin. I am an independent scholar in history and a dentist. I'm a member of the 2015 Society, the Harriet Tubman Legacy Society, and a major contributing partner at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So how did I get into this? Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you a fascinating uh, investigation that I did on uh, my homestead ancestors. I started my research researching uh, Stephen Miner, who had a plantation in Concord in, in um, Natchez, Mississippi. And I discovered that my great-great-grandfather was uh, Willie Franklin, who was from Africa, born in 1774. So I became very interested in following all of his descendants. He had a number of children. The first descendant I found was uh, Kimberly Holmes, who uh, had found that she descended from Shedrick Franklin and his wife, and that they were in uh, on a plantation called Waterloo in Ascension Parish, and that his wife had become a homesteader. So this is fascinating. Then I went with a friend of mine, Brianna Riley, to uh, look at the archives in Natchez, and we found that her ancestor, Sally, was Sally Franklin Thompson. So then I knew that I would be looking for Thompsons and Franklins in Ascension Parish. So uh, what we have here is a pick, uh, something to let you know that all of the land that was in Ascension Parish was contested land that was available for the homesteaders. So uh, right after the Civil War, we started uh, settling on this on this land. Uh, the arrow shows you uh, approximately where we are. If you think uh, midway between uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge near I-10, that's where we are. So this the problem started in 1776 when the Indians sold the, the land to some whites and the whites continued to fight over the land until about 1808 when the legal battles began. So the legal battles were going on when Frank got his, uh, started settling in 1872. So Frank settled from 1872 to 1892, that's his 10 years, I mean, his 20 years uh, in the, on, uh, on 40 acres in section 27 of what's called the New River Settlement. So uh, while he is, during that 20 year period, that's what's interesting that happened. Um, the Supreme Court decided what the situation would, what, it, well, the, the Supreme Court made a ruling on the homeless land claim on this land and who, who, who the owners would be. And they said that the Supreme Court said that there would be a uh, uh, enabling legislation. But just, just moments after, days after the Supreme Court decision, the owners of the plantations uh, on the riverfront claimed that the land was theirs. And that was, uh, uh, so the main person there is uh, Crosley. So Crosley, uh, we go to the next slide. Okay, so this is Waterloo Plantation. This is where we were enslaved and we uh, settled on land to the rear of Waterloo Plantation. The 1884 Supreme Court decision decided who the owners would be uh, in the rear land, in the lands that are rear of the 
waterfront plantations. So Crosley owned three of these plantations on the waterfront and he claimed that he owned all the land in the rear because one plantation had land that extended into the, into the rear area. So he is now uh, in 1884, right after the Supreme Court decision, he sues all of the settlers who are on the land saying that it's his land and that uh, we're trespassing. So this, this is a very difficult situation. Uh, we had been assured in 1868 that this land was public land by the uh, US uh, Surveyor General. Ascension Parish at that time had Milton Morris as a state representative. It had Pierre Landry as the mayor. It had, uh, by 72, we had all black police jury. We thought that we had the right information on this. So we, we settled in that area. Uh, Should I move on to the next slide? No, 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 no we're not gonna do that quite yet. So um, in 1888, no, so in 18, well, really, in, it was really more around 1887 that it happened. In 1887, there was a, a, a massacre in Thibodeau of uh, sugar cane workers who uh, had been evicted from their homes. They were uh, seeking uh, payment in cash rather than in script. And uh, unarmed Black people of all ages were, were murdered. And, and I, I believe that we can see that Crosley uh, was quite frightened by this. Uh, he didn't want to be involved in anything like this. And he um, sold the plantations to Ellis. So just the next year, then the Supreme Court comes up with the gay bill that they said would be used to enable who would, who would own it. But as we know, they've already claimed, you know, now Ellis owns it and he claims he owns it. So what happened next is what's shocking. So what they do is they make a decision in Ascension Parish, the judge did on the Crosley case, because that's still pending. And so he says that all of the people there are trespassing and that the plaintiff, that is Ellis, could take possession of all the contested land. So at that point in time, you've got to, they, uh, next slide. So at that point in time, they were told that they were going to be evicted, and uh, they are, you know, these people have been working very hard on this, and I think it's said best by uh, Arthur Burnett, if you turn to the next slide, Arthur Burnett, who's a leading citizen, and he said, I do not think that any community exists in the world which would not sympathize with us in this misfortune that has come to us. It seems indeed hard that after 20 years of industry through sickness, bad crop years and all discouraging discouragements, attending opening new lands and paying debts, taxes and expenses that without any equivalent, we must surrender everything. And he had had his land since 1892, I'm sorry, 1869. So these are, these are people who have everything to lose. And so these black leaders asked for a rehearing and the judge denies it and so the next month the marshal and the armed deputies come to uh, expel us from the property. And if you didn't want to leave, you're going to be charged $3 an acre. So this was the difficulty that we faced. And Frank was able to show through the enabling legislation that his land was, in fact, public land and that he could keep his homestead. So he did, and of the, in, through my investigation, I found that perhaps 30 of the families could keep their land and about out of about 137 families. So in my family, some did and some didn't, but uh, the final proof uh, for uh, Frank was in 19, I'm sorry, 1895. So, and, and after that time, there were still more lawsuits that he had to overcome. There was one lawsuit involving his section 27 where Ellis was suing uh, Crosley, still trying to get more of the public land declared theirs. And then by uh, 1910, they, they started focusing specifically on Frank and they um, 
to, to, to try to get his land. And they tricked some of his children into selling their uh, share of their inherited land from their mother who was deceased. And at that point, the, 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 the uh, cards were stacked against Frank. He uh, did not show up at the hearing when he was being sued. And uh, they were, he knew that they were relentless and were gonna get his land. So he, uh, in a compromise, sold his half to uh, Picard and Geisel. And then, then uh, you can see it's very complicated. What happened then was Geisel, Picard and Geisel managed to get a sheriff's sale of the entire uh, for 40 acres. And as a result, the heirs of Frank then would get their share. And what happened, what it amounted to was the heirs got $11.45 each. That's equivalent of $4 an acre. And you know they wanted us to rent the property at $3 an acre. But at least they got that. And uh, by 1929, uh, one of Frank's heirs became a, a landowner, patented landowner. So the, the, the Thompson family ended up being major landowners in Ascension Parish. This was just Frank's story. There were others and uh, in, even in my family, uh, Frank had two brothers and then uh, his daughters, Sally's daughters had uh, their husbands who were involved in these land ownerships. So um, it's a mixed story of, in terms of success, but we feel that as long as you had the aspiration to own land, that, uh, that you were a survivor. That's, that's enough. You can take that down now. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, your, your, your story and the legal battles that they went through are really fascinating, really unique. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Franklin. Um, we are ready for Dr. Harrell. And you should be able, let me stop my screen sharing and you should be able to do yours. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Antoinette Harrell. Um, I am focused on St. Helena because my Richardson branch of the family uh, came out of St. Helena. Let me just share my screen. Uniting the Richardson claim, St. Helena, and Tangible Hole Parish. Um, my family have been in St. Helena from the foreman of St. Helena, although they are not there anymore, and they do not own any land there. The ancestors that I'm speaking focusing on is Andrew, who filed his application number 2180 in New Orleans on August the 10th, 1878. And he paid the sum of $7. Now we know that $7 was a hard $7 because they just didn't have the money that we would have today. And when I think of St. Helena, I think in, in terms of traveling to New Orleans, the expense that that would have cost them for me to travel to New Orleans right now will cost me $80 going to both going and coming. But nevertheless, I thought about how hard that could have been for him and his wife, uh, Sarah. Andrew lived on his 40 acres because that's what he um, land patent, 40 acres. And he lived there since March the 7th, 1871. The pictures that you're looking at here is the descendants of Andrew. Now, what we're looking at here is a DNA testing of everyone that was on the plantation belonging to Cecilia and uh, Benjamin Richardson. So we all still have that surname. We never changed the name, we kept the name. We knew that there was other, there was 23 people on the plantation. I really want to know if there was any relationships between my Carrie and my Thomas and Andrew and those others that was on that plantation, since it was just such a small number of people, 23 was basically easy to discuss taking a DNA test to see if there was any relations there. The inventory of Benjamin and Cecilia Bankston put uh, Nathaniel, which was $1,100, and then my carry on the same plantation. Nathaniel is the father of Andrew. 
So that had me to probe a little bit deeper to find out if there could have been any relations there. Andrew was born in 1852 and he died in 1908. Um, when I first started researching the family history, and I want to give a shout out to my and members of my mother who shared so much family history with me and made it possible for me to really connect the dots looking at other information. Andrew Richardson is buried at Black Creek AME Church in St. Helena Parish. Most of the Richardson family members have moved out of St. Helena and now they live in Tangipahoe Parish. This is my Thomas Richardson, the husband of Amanda. Thomas was born in 1853, just one year after Andrew, and he died in 19, uh, in 18, 1922, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 1923. And he is buried at Rocky Hill Cemetery. And uh, my grandfather, Thomas, who owned land, and he had land taken away from him. And that was the beginning of him having to uh, live in asylums because he basically lost his mind after having 40 of the 80 acres taken away from him. So we was very happy to see that Andrew was the first person in the family that uh, filed the claim to be a homesteader. And I want to thank Bernice Alexander Bennett, Bennett for really guiding me into that research because I had no reason to even look in that area because I didn't see anything until Bernice said, look, let me help you. And so I just want to thank her so much for doing that because not only did I find my one ancestor there, I was able to help other family members with different branches of their families to find uh, their family members, uh, Black homesteaders. So once again, I want to thank you, Amanda and Bernice, for inviting me to share my story with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrell. That, that was fantastic. So um, we'll have one um, last uh, word from Bernice about uh, a, um, a homesteader, and then we will move on to the question and discussion portion. Bernice. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just want to uh, reiterate just the process so that those of you that are listening to us will know that if you think your ancestors acquired land, that you want to go to the Bureau of Land Management. And the Bureau of Land Management will basically show you the information where the land office is located, how many acres they acquired, the date that they acquired that land. But there's something very interesting that happens when you look at the land entry papers, because this is a final testimony from my own ancestor. And he acquired 159.33 acres of land. You heard about some of the issues individuals face when they were looking for land. Well, this is a statement directly out of the land entry papers where Peter Clark went for his final testimony and he basically said, and this is in writing, I didn't make it up before me. He personally came uh, you know, to apply, to, to tell them I'm ready. I've lived on this land for seven years, but this is the problem. He went to apply for the final, going through the final steps on April 1894, and it was really too late. It had actually expired. And so in this statement, it says, he is a very poor man. And that until today, he has not been able to get money to pay the cost of making proof. And this is the earliest day he had the money that he lived on and cultivated his land in good faith for over 10 years. When I read that, I was like in tears. He lived there for 10 years and almost lost his land. And it would work a great hardship were he deprived of his entry. So he asked, you know, could you please accept my final proof? I want you all to know that Peter Claw did get his land. This is his land patent. This is the original patent, which is in the hands of a family member right now 
and he did get his land. Folks, when we talk about some of the trials and tribulations and the things that our family members went through, we can now say we have proof that they did obtain the land and so, so much. And this is why many individuals are encouraged to write and share their stories. We need to hear what those stories are all about. We need to know, you know, what Dr. Dolores Mercedes Franklin's family went through. We need to hear about the Richardsons or hear about what Henry and Julia Gordon went through. I mean, a widow. But you also have others that have written their stories. And these are the faces of all of the descendants of the homesteaders that have written uh, stories for Louisiana. So I want to just stop my sharing now, but definitely encourage all of you, look for your land owning ancestors and then tell the story. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Bernice. Um, so I would love um, if, if all our panelists would, wouldn't mind sharing their video. Um, I'd love to open this up to questions, comments, discussion from the audience. Um, as audience members, I've just allowed you all to, um, you, you can type your question in chat if you want me to ask it, or if you um, want to share your story or comment, um, please raise your hand and I can, um, you guys can turn on your, uh, your, uh, your mics and cameras and, and ask yourselves. So yes, please, please. Don't be shy, Hello. anybody. Hello, this is Kathy Hambrick in Ascension Parish. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, Miss Bennett. Hi, Miss Franklin. Hi, Antoinette. Um, I wanted to say to um, Dr. Franklin, I own four acres of land that on the back of my property is New River. Um, New River... Um, as you mentioned, uh, this area in Ascension Parish is on the east bank of the Mississippi River. It's the town of, uh, runs through the town of Gonzales. For those of you who are familiar with I-10, uh, Gonzales up to Geismer and Dutchtown, um, where uh, Geismer is where the Waterloo Plantation was. The Thompson family is quite a well-known family here. The Thompsons and Stevens still today own a um, hundred acres of land. The family collectively owns over a hundred acres of land in each one of those surnamed groups. So I I want to um, hopefully bring you to the River Road African American Museum in person, where you can talk to some of these family members, they are still dealing with land issues because of eminent domain. And for those of you who also know this area, this is the petrochemical corridor. So many of the chemical plants and oil companies um, have either purchased land and they are pretty much being threatened by highways and roads and other commerce that has surrounded the very rural area by industrial development. Thank you, Kathy. Yes. Oh, if I could bring up my last slide because I didn't talk about it. Oh, yeah, let me, let me pull it up. Let me pull that one up because that will show you why this land was so desirable. There it is. There it is. We see Frank's homestead there. It is right on New River mm. and it's at the junction of New River and what's called Good Road. This is back in, you know, eight, in 1862. It's called Good Road and there were bad roads. So he had a very a strategic location. He is halfway between the Mississippi River and Dutch Store. And Dutch Store is a major merchant and that is Picard's store. And Picard owns at this time, at the time that he was dealing with him, Waterloo Plantation. So Waterloo Plantation is right on the river and Dutch Store is uh, on the good road and Frank is right in the middle of it. Very, very desirable property. And, and that's where the families live today, the Stevens and the Thompsons. And that community is known as Dutch Town now. And it's right there at the Prairieville Dutch Town exit of I-10. 
between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. You also mentioned the Miner family, Stephen Miner's family from Natchez, who owned Linwood Plantation and Waterloo Plantation. And one of the chemical companies did extensive uh, research on the enslaved people there, of which there were over 200, and they have installed a memorial with all of the names of the enslaved people who were at Linwood Plantation. And um, one of the roads right there off of Highway 30 has been named after a formerly enslaved man named Lawrence Minor uh, just in the past 12 months. So I look forward to seeing you in Ascension Parish and, and maybe um, you say that this is your family. So maybe we can get some of them to come and meet you personally. The descendants. I hope so. Thank you very much. I love this. This is fabulous. Thank you, Kathy. I've, I've put a link to the African American, the River Road African American Museum in the chat for everybody. It is a wonderful museum for sure. So please be sure to visit it if you can. Um, I wanted to allow Jane Tillman Irving to make her comment. Um, you're welcome to unmute and un uncamera yourself as you choose. Well, I'll just speak on uh, on on audio, but I was wondering, and I think the question has been answered, but I was wondering why the land was so strategic that the dispute over it went as far as the United States Supreme Court. But now I see it was strategically located and it turned out later to be valuable in terms of mineral rights and oil rights, but it was the strategic location, I take it, that really left, that really led to all of this. Is that correct? The strategic location, yes, and also just the the greed of the land speculators. They wanted the land. They wanted to claim that all of that land was theirs, which is most of the parish of Ascension Parish. They want someone wants to claim that that's all my property. I think that's a good example of American greed. One of the things that you will find in the Black Homesteaders book is that most of the people were focusing on the acquisition and not what happened to the land. Some will state that their family members still on land, but there of course is a story. What happened to the land once they acquired it, and they, so we need to continue the story and continue telling people, well, yes, our family members did get land. I mean, you talk about resilience and self-reliance, and we're talking about intergenerational wealth. Some of them lost that land, but the thought, the mentality, the fact that, yes, we should own land, it continued, and it continued generation after generation. And so we're letting people know our ancestors didn't go from enslavement to sharecropping and that's all they did. They did make that step forward to achieve that American dream. And in spite of the fact that some of the land had to go up to the Supreme Court, you know, I found what happened to my land. We all have stories that we must tell. And if we don't tell them at all, then we have, we're not honoring our ancestors. And so I believe that this is something that we should do. And as I mentioned, the Black Homesteader book is 49 stories, but you know there are a lot more stories that need to be told. And this is something that I wanna just keep encouraging people, tell your stories, but find your land. Look for that land under the Homestead Act of 1862 and just continue to track what's going on with that land. Oh, thank you, Bernice. Um, I have a couple of questions from chat if I could share them. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Cheryl Montgomery. There was a Scott shown as a contributor. Where is his family land? Not uh, Felix, yes, that land is in plain dealing. Louisiana, which is up there in Bossier Parish, and his ancestors, George Paysinger. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And then our next question is from Cheryl Brown. Um, uh, Bernice, you mentioned the Bureau of Land Management. Does this apply? Do I go to all states or do I locate an office where my grandparents were born? 
what you will do is go to the Bureau of Land Management Patent and you will see all, I mean, you could just put in your state, put in the parish and then put in your ancestor's name. And I wanted to share, that's that's the link to where you would do that, um, Cheryl Brown, that mm -hmm. link that I just put in chat, just click on that and it should open in your browser, but that's the government, uh, that's the Bureau of Land Management government land office records. And okay. once you find that land, then you can order your land entry papers. That's the key to get the papers because the papers will provide you with information as was mentioned earlier by Crystal. She read information about her ancestors that she didn't even know. And she had one of the largest land entry case files that I've ever seen. It was 42 pages long, but the information was like a treasure trove. It just opened up history. So you, when you read the land entry papers, you're reading a piece of your family's history that won't be anywhere else but in those land entry case files, which are located at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Excellent. Yes, yes, Cheryl. I hope you got all that. Um, I have a couple of comments. Um, Jerry Bell says one of the men that she's been researching was William Rutherford Minor, originally from Louisiana. She wonders if he came from this area. I think it could certainly be possible for sure. Um, and let's see, what do we have next? Um, Lenora Gobert. Um, She's noted that if you're interested in the fight of community members against petrochemical industry takeover, check out labucketbrigade.org. And let me, um, and, and, and Lenora is correct. Let me um, post that in the chat for you. There it is. Um, there's a, it, it is um, endemic to the area that rural communities, especially of color are bulldozed at the legal level by the petrochemical industry. Um, there are a lot of issues going on right now. I think uh, LouisianaBucketBrigade.org is important to check out. There's also a new Louisiana Endowment of the Humanities film called Iron Sharpens Iron that you can see on their um, website. And that is about uh, the community of Ironton and how um, a Plaquemines terminal wanted to build oil tankers on top of their historic cemetery. We'll actually be showing that at the Algiers Regional Library in September, but that's way in the future. You can view it now if you go to leh.org. But um, let's see here. Um, does anybody else want to share any stories or, or um, ask any questions? Please raise your hand. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask. And also you can type it in chat. This is Kathy Hambrick again. I wanted to tell Dr. Franklin that I have a photo, um, a vintage photo of Arthur Burnett. His family owns land at I-10 and Burnside. Uh, they are uh, continue the legacy of being a family of ministers. He was a minister who also started a Rosenwald School here in Ascension Parish. So that's another family that I'd like to introduce you to. Ascension Parish had one of the largest number of elected officials during Reconstruction anywhere in the country. And Mr. Burnett was very politically active as a minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And I'd like to make one more comment about him and also suggest to the uh, audience that when you're researching your family, have a very good family tree so that you can really see who they are. So in my case, I looked at the children of the children of the children and their husbands and wives and searched all of them on the land management site. I searched every family that was uh, evicted on the land management site to see if they got their property because there was no newspaper coverage of this. They didn't cover it. So uh, if you do that, that site is just, it, just invaluable. It's just an invaluable site to get information. So I did find out that one of the Thompson children married Arthur Burnett's daughter. So there's a lot of that going on. And so people who might look like they didn't have land, if they married into a family with land, then they have land. So mm -hmm. it's, it's many generations are involved in this. Actually, I'm really glad that you said that 
because when you start looking at those witnesses, and I want to just say from my own research, the witnesses' children ended up marrying each other, which means that, you know, they continued, they continued to perpetuate the land ownership dynasty, if you will. But certainly when you must look, even if your ancestors didn't own land, maybe the adjacent land was owned by someone and your ancestors served as a witness. So when we look at this whole document, the whole land entry papers, look at every single name on the land entry papers. It may amaze you to what you may uncover or for that matter, discover. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Um, here's here's a question from from Gerilyn Isaac. Uh, my husband's father always said his family had a large amount of land that has been passed down for many generations. His father has passed away, and this was never confirmed. What are the steps to confirm this? The land is in Amy, out Louisiana. Just as um, the steps will be the same. First of all, you have identified that there is land in the family. So now go to the Bureau of Land Management to determine if they received that public land. If they did not receive public land, you certainly want to go to the courthouse, wherever your ancestors uh, land was acquired, to see what's in there in the various record groups, because you may find that they purchased that land. And just keep tracking it all the way, but definitely start, if you can, at the Bureau of Land Management to confirm or to rule out that that land was public land. That's excellent. Yes, I've just, I've dropped the um, link in there one more time. Um, and also, um, uh, let me find uh, the Tangipahoa Parish Clerk of Court website really fast. And then I'll also share the Louisiana Clerk's Portal, or I believe it's called eClerk now, which grants some access to uh, records from across the state. But let me get the Tangipahoa Clerk of Court for you. Okay. Here is the link directly to the Clerk of Court website. And then um, let's see here, while I am looking up the second part of the eClerk portal, um, I want to, uh, Priscilla Dickerson has said, thank you for sharing your stories. I've learned so much from each presenter. I will be purchasing copies of this book for herself and her Auburn Avenue Research Library, which is fabulous. This is great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Jerry Bell asks, what would the roles and responsibilities of the land agents have been? She's thinking about former Reconstruction era Mississippi Secretary of State Jim Hill, who became a railroad land agent later in life. I have not really uh, done any research on the role of the land agents, so I can't truly respond to that question. I think that what you want to do, though, is look at who were the register of lands in the various land offices. Uh, one register of land I discovered was um, uh, from Louisiana, and he uh, he signed on many of the land entry papers. So you want to you know study, look at who the what was happening in that community politically, uh, look at who was there supporting the individuals. There's certain places in Louisiana where a lot of land was acquired. And you wanna know why, what was happening there uh, in those particular communities? Cause I found others, I mentioned plain dealing for George Pacinger. Well, I found other black homesteaders in that particular community. My ancestor was in Livingston Parish in a place called Marpa. Lots of black homesteaders there. What was going on in that community? So we have to do some community genealogy and start asking those questions. Crystal has a question. <laughs> well, more of a statement um, and sort of to go along with what Bernice just said, you do have to research that whole community. Uh, it turns out that, and I don't know if I said this before, my 88 year old cousin, one of the last living grandchildren of George, her family um, on her mother's side, when I look right across the state line, and I've mentioned this to Bernice probably a month or two ago, go across, they all were homesteaders. 
And so those are the next stories that we have to, you know, get the papers and we, we're going to start writing those. I'm going to assist her to write them because that was her family. Uh, but it's something about that whole area that there were so many more Black homesteaders there. And those are just things and stories that have never been told. But some of that land is still in their family. So, you know, a lot of the new generation, the younger generation, uh, they don't know these stories. And these are things that need to be told. Yeah, that that's so true. I, I think... Um... The way that you have started collecting all this, Bernice, is just, I mean, well, obviously it's pioneering in its own in its own way. <laughs> I mean, it continues the homesteader spirit in such a in such an important way. And um, I also want to um, can I can we share the National Park Service website um, that you've worked with them on? Oh, I think I, I think I've got it. I will share it in the chat. But um, I, what what everybody has done here is is made this history just a tad more accessible to everybody but as everybody has said today you know repeatedly this journey isn't over uh, we always look forward to um people um contributing more uh oh i see that uh jane tillman irving has raised her hand if you want to go ahead jane yes i wonder how widespread is this nationally we see these clusters of very entrepreneurial and land owning land uh owning people in the in this particular area but how widespread is this nationally surely there must have been other clusters in other parts of the country farther west farther northwest and i'm wondering how much has been researched in that area okay so what you're seeing is a map and this map consists of the 30 homestead states and the center for um the great plains has done a lot of research on the homestead steaders, the black homesteaders of the Great Plains. So they have done extensive research. Uh, if you see land that are, you see the, the teal colored uh, states, those are not public land states, but we need to be looking for land ownership in all of these other states of which we have not been doing. And so there is a, a Facebook page called the Descendants of African American Homesteaders. And this is a place where you could go, you know, tell people about your ancestors, tell them what you're looking for, and you may find others that have found their homesteaders. We have Black homesteaders out of Michigan. We have a person who's just written her story about Oklahoma. We have Missouri stories. So it is widespread, but it's not talked about as much as it needs to be talked about. And frankly, every single homestead descendant can write their own book. This is just the beginning. This is kind of the first of the Black homesteaders of the South. But let me tell you all, I would love to see Black homesteaders tell their stories from all of these different states. And so this website, uh, the Homestead National Historical Park, is encouraging individuals to write your homestead stories. And to get that story uh, submitted, you must have your land entry case files, which means that you have to do your homework. And doing your homework means getting those case files. And I want you to know that those case files are, they come in, I'm, I'm pulling going back because this is what some of the case files look like, but they are in big boxes and this is what they look like. And you can see what uh, is record group 49, I went to the National Archives. Every last one of these boxes consists of a story from a Black homesteader. And when you open up these boxes, you may find as many as 50 packets of land stories in here. But if you don't know it, you don't search for it. So my encouragement to all of you, at least take a look. If you find that your ancestors own land, you're going to see a patent. You know, and the patent itself, and this is what the patent looks like if you go to the Bureau of Land Management, that's the end of the process. 
Getting your land entry papers will take you to the beginning of the process. And so that's the story we want you to tell. When did they settle on the land? How many acres of land? Who lived in the household? Who were the witnesses? Let them describe what they've done and what did they do to qualify for that land? That's, that's the story. That's the story that needs to be told. This is great. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Kathy says this is an incredible example of self-sufficiency where we see the promise of 40 acres and a mule as a failure. I've said for years, we purchased hundreds of acres on our own. Kudos to you all. And then let's see here. Uh, um, this is great. Can't wait to dive into my family's history. Thank you all. And then we have uh, one person with their hand raised if they would like to speak. Hi, it's Jerry. Just wanted to uh, thank Bernice and all the presenters for a great presentation. And I would just add for anybody else who's looking for land ownership um, to also take a look at urban real estate. Uh, most of the research that I've done, the folks that I've been researching were urban landowners. And in 1908, um, uh, black citizens of Jackson, Mississippi owned about 30% of the city's taxable real estate. So there was property ownership in the cities as well as out uh, in these areas that were being managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And that's why I was asking about Jim Hill. Um, I was wondering if maybe he had a role in sort of helping families who had never owned property before navigate the bureaucracy and find suitable property that they could afford to buy either to live on or for investment. Thank you. I also want to mention a site of which I, I don't know if you have the uh, link, Amanda. Which History one? Geo. History. Oh yeah, History Geo. Let me grab that one. Yes. Right. And I, I want to just show you all what I'm speaking of when I say History Geo. History Geo is a site where you can find the first landowners. And here is a person named Labram Brock. He obtained his land in 1892. And here he is on History Geo as the first landowner. And so I put that there because it's important for us to just track where, where our folks were. And this is what the story looks like on the National Park Service website. And this is just extra, just so that you could see that, yes, the land is documented. It's all documented. This is the Cyprian uh, family out of um, Covington, Louisiana. And again, here is the land on that History Geo site. And you'll see other names like Emil Baham was one of his witnesses. So it's so exciting, you know, when you can find that land, go to History Geo, see that your ancestor is listed as the first landowner of that land. And we just need to keep telling the stories, folks, just keep doing it. And Jerry, thank you for your information also about Mississippi. We do have our second largest number of stories are from Mississippi. Yes, the book is incredible. Um... Gerilyn wants to say thank you for all the information. Um, she has purchased your book. Uh, they noticed that a contributor to the book for Washington Parish, and that is her great, great grandfather, Will McGee. He was okay. a farmer who owned his land in the parish. That's incredible, Gerilyn. That's that uh, that's great. This is this this means so much. Um, Let's see here. And then, and Cheryl, I, I shared um, with, I, she got disconnected. So I shared a lot of the links and um, Cheryl, I can send you um, a copy of all those afterwards. If you uh, just want to email me, you can respond to the, um, or well, uh, my here, let me put my email address here for everybody. If you have any questions, I'm happy to forward them to the correct person, the correct panelist today. If that's okay with y'all, I'll forward a question, additional questions to y'all. Um, here is my uh, email address for that purpose, everyone. I am putting it in chat right now. And, and Cheryl, please email me and I will make sure to get you the links. And anybody else who wants the links that were dropped in chat, um, just as one email together, um, please email me. I'll be happy to put those together for you. But um, 
Yeah. Amanda, yeah. I just want to thank you so much for your support of the Black Homesteaders of the South book and for helping us get the story out. It is so important that we are allowed to tell our stories. And I want to just thank the descendants that have participated in this book. You know, it was a it was a thought, hey, what do you all think about us putting together a book? And the descendants said, yes, they would be willing to write a story for this book. So it's not just my story, it's all of our stories. And all of our stories can multiply over and over again when we encourage and inspire others to also tell their stories. That's what it's all about now. I know the historians will talk about, we ran out of the South, we didn't tell our stories, we didn't get land, but yes, we did get land. And yes, some of our ancestors did stay in the South. So we want those stories to be told. This means so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you everybody for participating today. This was wonderful. Um, Let's see here. And one final question, I guess we will take. Um, we have from Cheryl Montgomery. Uh, when will the recording be available from this webinar? So that will be available towards the end of the month. I will be sure to email everybody who registered for the program um, using the email address they registered with to send the link. But if you would like to go ahead and subscribe to the channel now, I've just dropped it in chat. That's the City Archives um, YouTube. And Dr. Franklin, please. I just want to thank Bernice because even during COVID, she put out the call for, the, for us to write. And we did this research, some of us, during COVID at great difficulty. <laughs> but we wanted to deliver for Bernice because we knew that it was going to be a good book. We'd already read her book on her ancestor, the first book in the series. So now we have our own stories out there too. Thank you so much. And I know it was difficult doing COVID, yes, but you delivered, <laughs> you delivered. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, and, and both of those books, if, if you're local, if you're at New Orleans Public Library, both of Bernice's books are available for checkout if you all are interested. I think I, I highly recommend it. I've been looking through these ever since Bernice first reached out to me, which was, what, goodness. When was it? It was like last September, <laughs> but we made it happen. You, you've been burning a trail across the, like the country um, speaking about this. You are evangelizing this and it's necessary. So thank you. And thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Harrell, Dr. Holliday, and Mrs. Williams Jackson. This, this, all of these stories were incredible and unique stories. And that's, that's the other thing is it's every, every like recollection, every um, description is, is totally unique. You will have a unique story if you, if you set out to do this research, which is incredible. But again, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you everybody who attended today. Um, I will, um, as I said, I will make sure that these recordings are posted by the end of the month and everybody who is here today or registered will be getting an email with the links when they are up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, I guess I guess we can say goodbye and we can enjoy our Saturday afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. So much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.